Today we'll be interviewing Joel Brownold, the U.S. Director of the Alliance for Middle East Peace, uh, often referred to as ALMEP. Originally from the U.K., Joe, Joel has spent the past five years working at the intersection of civil society and geopolitics, with a particular emphasis on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He's also a columnist for Haaretz, the more progressive of Israel's major daily newspapers, and has been published in the Huffington Post, The Hill, and The Daily Beast. Joel currently lives in Chicago with his wife, which actually comes as a surprise to me since I know how much time he actually spends on Capitol Hill. So welcome, Joel. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks very much for having me. So, Joel, let's start with a question about ALMEP. What is ALMEP and how is it different from other organizations working for peace in the Middle East? Um, so the Alliance for Middle East Peace is basically the trade association for the peace and reconciliation movement between Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians. We currently have 91 members uh, and our role uh, is to is to basically grow our members resources, whether that's helping them work better together uh, on the ground, helping them to sort of leverage off each other's successes, uh, work on their programming, sort of pick up their ambition or be it on Capitol Hill uh, and elsewhere, trying to find global resources. So to help them glow the global pot of resources, to help them do their programming. So we, working with members of Congress, uh, have sort of unlocked over $70 million into the field over the past seven years. Uh, hopefully it'll be $80 million after this current congressional appropriation cycle. And outside of Congress, we work with private philanthropy and business uh, to try and encourage them to invest in this work. And then the last thing that we do is really try and talk to opinion makers, policy formers, business leaders, captains of industry uh, to make sure that they understand that the work that this community does isn't nice. It isn't just cute, but it's necessary. Right. And, and if it's necessary that we take it just as necessary as the economics of this conflict and of the politics of this conflict. Um, and so all map differs because we don't sort of work on you know, policy shifts in the U.S. and we don't implement on the ground, but rather we focus specifically on picking up the capacity, the ambition and the resourcing of those who are trying to make uh, who are trying to build trust between uh, divergent populations on the ground. So you're probably the only organization that has that particular focus. Yes. Yeah. So how did you come to do this work uh, and how did you get involved with all MEP uh, in particular? So um, I grew up in the UK uh, in uh, in the British uh, Jewish community and spent uh, a lot of time in uh, actually a religious Zionist youth movement called B'nai Kiva and then spent two years in a theological college in Jerusalem between 2004 and 2006. And having been there for the disengagement from Gaza and then going back to UK campuses, I got very involved in, in national student politics in the UK and ended up being one of the 27 students who ran the National Union of Students in the UK. Uh, and from that vantage point in 2009, after the Operation Cast Lead, the first war in Gaza, I really sort of was not interested in advocating for one side or the other, but really wanted to see what I could do to try and help the populations and be accountable to them and their wishes. And I started working for one of the members of an all map, a group called the One Voice Movement. And I worked for them for two and a half years in Europe before uh, doing some graduate work uh, in Boston. Uh, and then after a break in the private sector, going back to work for the PeaceWorks Foundation, which is sort of uh, the, the foundation behind One Voice. And having done that for another two years, I, I was ready to move to Chicago and not really and sort of move out of this work. And I got a call from Gidon Bromberg, who is the founder of Echo Peace and is the chair of Allmap. Uh, and he let me know that uh, Allmap was looking for a new director. And that given my work on partnerships and sort of strategic planning, would this be something I would be interested in? Uh, and I had an interesting interview process with the board and sort of got involved. And what made me very passionate about the organization was really trying to work out how as a field we can do our work better and how we can collectively support them to do that work better. Well, that's a great lead into the next question. Uh, you mentioned a couple organizations that you actually worked for that are all MEP members. Can you um, 
Can you tell us a little bit, uh, give us some examples of other organizations that are part of ALMEP, maybe sort of a representative uh, selection, and describe the kind of work that they actually do on the ground? Sure. So ALMEP uh, has members that work in every societal sector. So from agriculture to the environment, to sports, to education, to political advocacy, sort of, you know, advocating for minority rights. Um, they're all our members. Our members both work within the Green Line, so between Arab and Jewish citizens of Israel uh, and across border uh, in cross border work. So, you know, one example would be sort of the work of Echo Peace, which is a uh, Israeli, Palestinian and Jordanian environmental organization that works on shared water resources between the populations uh, and looks at how can water be used as a source for peace building rather than as a source for conflict. Uh, and they've been sort of working in the field since, I think, 1993 uh, and have done some remarkable work on cleaning up the Jordan River uh, and putting fresh water in there instead of pouring sewage. You know, another group that's, you know, got very high brand recognition would be Seeds of Peace that take uh, Israeli and Palestinian as well as kids from America and other conflict zones. Uh, to a camp in Maine and then sort of after they've had that experience do year long work with their graduates and sort of retouch them back in to work out how they can support them to be change makers in the region. Um, another group, uh, Sukui, uh, is the Association for Civic Advancement in Israel uh, and works to try and equ uh, equalize funding that goes to both the Arab minority community as well as to the Jewish community in Israel. And one of their latest projects was uh, uh, an internal tourism project where they were encouraging Jewish Israelis to go visit Arab towns and cities uh, as part of an internal tourism project. And then one that's, you know, slightly more out the box, uh, you know, would be one that would be called Sofen, uh, which looks to place Arab Israelis into high tech uh, and does that through, um, uh, encar you know, building a human capital pipeline to push Arab Israelis uh, into that area and encouraging companies to open offices uh, in Arab cities and in doing so tries to link uh, Israel's economic engine of high tech to also civic advancement of the minority population. So, you know, everything in between and you, as you can imagine, there's something for everyone. Uh, and that's important because different people are passionate about different things, but finding ways to integrate that into building trust between populations is key if we're going to move the needle on this conflict. You know, Joel, when I talk to people about these kinds of programs, um, often people don't even realize that there are pro programs like this, and they're certainly surprised to find out how many there are. Uh, is that your experience? And if so, what are you doing to help people know more about what's happening at the grassroots? So, yes, I think people are often surprised to, to hear outside, but I think the general problem is, you know, there are many different fantastic programs, but it doesn't appear to be any narrative that connects any of these programs. So the challenge becomes it's very easy to create a negative narrative of what's going on, because whether that's, you know, settlement expansion, rockets falling, you know, there's always something negative that can demonstrate that nothing will ever be productive. Whereas these programs are often spots of light and in the media, they sort of get a human interest angle, but they're never seen as serious efforts. Uh -huh. So one of our challenges is to try and create a narrative to demonstrate what can, what can happen. But we, all, we also have to be serious. You know, these programs alone and by themselves aren't going to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They're not going to end the occupation. Uh, they're not going to sort of solve all Israel's securities. But without them, we're never going to progress forward because there is there is no trust left between Israelis and Palestinians. I think that it's that careful counterbalance that justifies the need to take these programs seriously at this point in time. Yeah, yeah, that narrative is so important, isn't it, in helping people understand um, it's such a complex conflict uh, with it is so many different narratives and so many conflicting interpretations of the facts. How do you describe the conflict when you're talking to somebody who knows nothing about it? Um, you know, it's interesting. That's an interesting question. I think that, you know, the best way to understand the conflict is to understand how each community frames it. So for the for the Israelis, this is an Israeli Arab conflict, right? So this is Israel versus the entire Arab world, of which the Palestinians are just sort of the local branch of. And so Israel sees itself as as the the David against the Arab Goliath and that, you know, every time it tries to make peace, it, it just gets rejected and attacked. And even those that it has peace with, it's a cold peace. 
Whereas for the Palestinians, this is a this is an Israeli occupation of Palestine, and that very clearly the asymmetry of the occupation is that Israel is the stronger and the Palestinians are the weaker. And understanding the completely different framings gives sort of the the background to why there often doesn't even to seem to be a common language of which to speak about whether this is an occupation or it's a conflict. You know, how do you even speak about this? And I think buried into that is, you know, a very universalist narrative of dispossession of colonialism that sort of the pro-Palestinian movement latches onto versus a very particular sort of narrative that the Israeli community sort of uh, perpetuates that, you know, often feeds off the the lessons of Jewish history uh, going back, you know, 4000 years of dispossession, of oppression and all, that, all the other parts that go into that. So given the fact that there are these kind of different ways that they think about the conflict, do you think there's hope for reconciliation? I think that we need to be clear that reconciliation doesn't mean a reconciling of the narratives. I I just don't believe that's possible. I think what we need to find is room to understand and appreciate that someone else's narrative doesn't automatically automatically negate your own and understand that we need to be comfortable with complexity and that the, there will not be winners in this conflict, right? Compromise means people are willing to accept something. That doesn't automatically mean it's 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 everyone's dream dreams. I think that that's a reality that sadly is the case in any conflict resolution. There is no there is no absolute restorative justice. However, each population would perceive the justice of of the mentality of the current moment. I think given that reality and understanding what that is. You know, there's there's a whole literature about how you sell compromise, but it starts with making sure that at least the populations trust each other. And I think given the failures of the past 20 years and, you know, we within this movement have also failed in many ways. We have to recognize and evolve our programming so that we can start rebuilding trust. I think that that's one of the messages that we need to understand. And we also need to be supported as we go through that that journey. So do you think the grassroots work really makes a difference? I think it does. And I think that, you know, the question is, how can it play its necessary role? You know, how does it move from just being a cute afterthought to being a key part of the, the solution? So part of that is, you know, now that after the past 20 years, you know, we've got groups within our network that have decent sized budgets and, you know, have really developed best practice. The challenge now is how do you scale them? So they need to scale their ambition and in, and then and then internationally, we need to find resources for them to help them do that, you know, because currently the, there isn't the resourcing there. But also the programs need to demonstrate how they can have a national effect. But again, if we take this in isolation to the economics or the politics, then I, I don't think that this will move the needle alone. But without it, we can't move the needle without it. So the way I talk about it is that this is a necessary but not sufficient part of conflict resolution. That makes a lot of sense. So I understand that ALMEP has actually been working to promote a piece of legislation that would establish an international fund modeled roughly on a similar fund that helped to end the troubles in Northern Ireland. Can you tell us about that, Bill, and your hopes for what a, what such a fund could do? Sure. So, you know, we roughly look and there's roughly, I don't know, $45 million spent per annum uh, p- uh, on peace and reconciliation between Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians. It sounds like a lot until you realize that there are 12 million Israelis and Palestinians. So it's just under four dollars a head. And when we looked at when we looked at Northern Ireland, there was over thirty three dollars being spent per head per year on peace and reconciliation. And that was through something called the International Fund for Ireland that was founded in two th- in in 1986 uh, through an agreement through Speaker Tip O'Neill and President Reagan. There was a multi-stakeholder fund that the UK, New Zealand, uh, Ireland, America, the private sector all kicked into. And over a 24-year period, it distributed $1.5 billion to the hands of Catholics and Protestants. And this, you know, was before the Good Friday Agreement and sustained afterwards. So what we envisage is a $200 million a year fund, uh, which would be funded by Congress. It would be funded by members of the European Union, by the rest of the international community, some moderate Arab states and uh, also by the private sector. And the aim isn't just to throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks, but rather to take the impactful programming that exists today and to scale it. 
and so that we ensure that those peacemakers have the tools that they need to actually do their work and scale it successfully. Because at the moment, there just simply are not the resources to scale what works onto a national level. And that the best way of doing it is to sort of leverage the donations of of state actors in the private sector and the different donors in the communities of each other in order to be successful. So what are some of the obstacles to getting this legislation passed? Uh, and in particular, do you think that the fact that both the U.S. and the EU have vested financial and military interests in the region, do you think that's a significant barrier? You know, I, I don't. I think that as long as the stated aim of the European Union and the United States and, you know, with the Air Peace Initiative is to try and get to a two-state solution, we need to try and invest in that. So, you know, at the moment, the U.S. gives what 3.1 billion to the Israelis in military assistance. They give 380 or 400 million to the Palestinian Authority and they give 10 million dollars to people to people work. Right. The EU simultaneously gives millions, hundreds of millions of euros to the Israelis in trade agreements and to the Palestinians in economic assistance and gives 5 million euro to people to people work. So the question becomes, are you investing in your policy or are you not? And that's not to say that the economic work is an essential uh, and the international community created the quartet, you know, in order to focus on Palestinian economic development. We need an equivalent to focus on the civics. And our argument is that the fund could be that that equivalent. Um, so I don't you know, I think that the obstacles are donor fatigue. I think that, you know, we need to demonstrate what this money would be spent on and also who's going to jump first. You know, is it yeah. Congress? Is it the EU? Is it, And we know that Congress has to jump first if it's going to have the Israelis on board. Uh, and, you know, it's very a it's a difficult funding environment to get anyone to spend any new money. And two, you know, Congress has a large docket of things to do. And um, it's a challenge to try and get them to focus on one thing. And, you know, part of our work is to try and get them to focus and to and to really, you know, work on this work as quickly as possible. What is your strategy on the Hill and how's it going? Well, you know, I, I should say that we have been um, successful at uh, we have been successful at, you know, making sure that we go narrow and deep. So we go to the key members in Congress on the appropriating committees and on the authorizing committees and make the argument to fund this work. And, you know, to our credit and to the credit of the legislators, they've listened. And despite the fact that it's never in the federal budget, we have made sure that our groups have received sort of stable funding despite budgetary cuts. And we are deeply thankful to the bipartisan support of Congresswoman Granger, Congresswoman Lowy, Senator Graham, Senator Leahy, who are the current four key appropriators, and also, you know, uh, Congressman uh, Fortenberry and Crowley, who are some of our champions and others. You know, it's been it's been really key. And Congressman Engel and Congressman uh, and, you know, and Congressman Royce and Senator Corker and Senator Cardin, you know, we do a lot of work and that's been the strategy. But I think that we need to therefore expand it. And some of this is talking about how the money that's been spent at the moment has been, you know, a pilot project and how you move on with that. But one of our key strategies and something that you, Andy, have taken play, you know, taken part in is really um, bringing two legislators, representatives from from the field and every year doing an advocacy day where they get to see representatives from the field and open their questions and they can actually see how they can support this work. But also it's about building wider coalitions. So we work with everyone. We work with APAC, we work with J Street, we work with the various think tanks, we work with the American Task Force on Palestine, we work with everyone. And in doing so, try to build the broadest based coalition to support this sort of work. So that's a great segue to our last question. Um, many of the listeners of this radio station are activists, and many of them care very deeply about peace in the Middle East. Do you have any suggestions for how they might get involved? Um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the best way is go onto our website, ormep.org, look at our members and sort of find something you're passionate about and then find the member who does that and support them. Whether that's speaking to them, giving them professional advice, helping them raise money, I think that's key. And I think if you're interested in the wider strategic element, you know, call your, you know, you can always feel free to pick up your phone to a member of Congress, tell them that you support the sort of money that's being spent on people to people work around the world and in Israel and Palestine in particular, and that you would urge them not only to continue to fund this work, but to find ways to expand the funding and support the international fund. Uh, great suggestions. I hope everybody out there is listening. 
So uh, t- in conclusion, Joel, is there anything else you want to say to the listeners? Um, you know, I, you know, uh, keep looking. Ne- if the, the thing I like to say is if your politics on this conflict can fit on a placard, you're normally doing something wrong. Right. It, that's not to say that the complexity of this conflict should should paralyze you. It's not to say that you shouldn't be an activist, but there are there are, the the complexities of this conflict are are such that you know don't don't alienate people from the conversation but try and find ways to bring as many people around the table to talk about constructive things that can be done that's not to say that anyone should be feeling that they should be excluded from the room or that you know you know as long as it's non-violent go for it but um you know i feel that the more people that can discuss this in a calm and measured way the better we're going to be in a situation to work out what we can do effectively Thanks so much for that, Joel. That's very consistent with the spirit of the show. Uh, so thank, thanks for joining us. Uh, we hope all of our listeners enjoyed this session of Let's Talk About the Middle East, the show where we provide context for a deeper understanding of the conflict in Israel and Palestine, as well as the rest of the Middle East. Take good care and spread the peace. Thanks very much.